right, for our next presenter, I would like to welcome to the screen, Jeff Bennett presenting Optical Fiber Capacity Limits, Where Do We Go Next? Jeff is Director, Solutions and Technology at Infinera. This is Jeff's second time presenting at Nanog, and it's a pleasure to have him speaking with us today. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you very much, Kat. Can you guys hear me okay? I'm hoping you can. Um, I'm going to share my presentation slides now. So, should be this screen and then share. And hopefully you see that. So, uh, yeah, thank you everyone for the uh, opportunity to present again. Um, and uh, another subject close to my heart, how optical networking transformed our world. Um, it's a big claim and um, I'm hoping that I can uh, justify it. So basically what I'm talking about here is the fact that back in 2020, we celebrated a, a 50 year anniversary. And it was 50 years of the combination of low loss optical fiber and semiconductor lasers. Because if you think about it, these are the oxygen that feeds the internet. Everything that I'm, everyone in this room actually uh, uh, is doing, not only for your day jobs as network operators, but also when you go home, uh, anytime at work, you need the kind of capacity that uh, optical fiber and semiconductor lasers deliver. So could we actually uh, operate the internet any other way? Um, so could we use copper? Could we use microwave technology? Well, the answer is no, because optical fiber is on a totally different capacity trajectory from these technologies. It's great to use ethernet cables to plug into your uh, network at home or, or perhaps at work. Uh, it's great to use wireless technology uh, in certain circumstances because it's so convenient, but it's never going to deliver the kind of capacity that optical fiber can provide over long distances. So what about satellites? We hear a lot about the Starlink constellation and um, it, it, it's a tricky number to come up with this. I did find a, a, an FCC uh, filing that mentioned the total capacity of the Starlink constellation might be as high as 24 terabits per second. By the way, if anyone has better uh, numbers on that, uh, I'd be happy to accept them because I always use this number in, in presentations. But if you think about it, that's about the same uh, capacity as a single fiber pair on one transatlantic submarine cable. Um, it's, you know, there is no way that this constellation uh, could replace fiber in terms of capacity. So, you know, why is it there? It's there for things like rural broadband or uh, mobile broadband technologies, or where we need to bypass some kind of state control. We've seen in Ukraine, for example, Starlink terminals being activated to provide connectivity. So these two technologies really came together back in 1970. That was the date when researchers realized it could actually work because they both have a very, very long history of development. Uh, and that history involves multiple Nobel Prizes. And of course, the end result is uh, is feeding the internet as we know it today. So I'd like, like to give you a, a, a very brief and exciting history of optical fiber. And it dates back quite a long time. There's a, an experiment that was first done by a Swiss physicist, Jean-Daniel Collodon, um, where he trapped light inside a tube of water. But actually, many of you might be thinking, well, hang on, isn't that the Tyndall experiment? Well, actually, John Tyndall did this much, uh, much later, 1859, uh, and he, he was demonstrating the phenomenon of total internal reflection. The reason we think of this as the Tyndall experiment is that John Tyndall was a bit like the Neil deGrasse Tyson of his day. He was a fantastic science communicator. Uh, and so the experiment tended to be associated with him. Now, I'm going to take my life in my hands here and, and hope that you're going to be able to see this video. Uh, it's actually from the Harvard Natural Sciences Department. Uh, it's a fantastic demonstration. Do this at home with your kids. It's a, a, As long as you don't use this 
kind of helium neon laser, you'll be fine. Just use a, a green uh, laser pointer um, and you can set it up in a similar way. But you've got a bottle full of water. You shine the laser through the hole that you, you put in, in the bottle of water. And the water is being held there at the moment because you see the guys releasing this uh, plug. And as soon as he releases that, it will allow the water to flow out. And you can see that the light is being trapped inside that tube of water. You can even see that it's bouncing off the insides of the tube of water. Uh, and that's total internal reflection. It's because the water has a higher refractive index than the air around it. Great experiment to do with, uh, with kids, in fact. So what we see then is a, a, a series of developments involving fiber optics, but not necessarily for communication. Uh, in 1930, Heinrich Lamm used bundles of fibers as a med medical endoscope. Now, of course, you know many of us have, have actually experienced endoscopy, uh, perhaps not in a pleasant environment, um, but it's an important diagnostic tool in medicine. Um, and and uh, later on, Narinda Singh coined the term fiber optics uh, uh, in, in talking about this kind of technology. But this was in the context of endoscopy. And in fact, there's an entire evolution of uh, fiber uh, for endos uh, endoscopy purposes. But it was really in 1965, we see the first idea of, of using fiber optics as a communication system. Uh, Manfred Borner, who worked for Telefunken in Germany, uh, and also Sir Charles Cow, who worked at Standard Telephone and Cables in the United Kingdom, uh, he made so many contributions uh, to the topic. He's often re uh, uh, remembered as the father of fiber optics. Um, and he, he laid down this, this goal that if you could produce an optical fiber which had a loss of less than 20 dB per kilometer, that could be useful for telecommunications purposes. Uh, and it wasn't just for that, but, but you know, for all of his contributions, um, he actually shared the 2009 Nobel Prize for Physics. 1970s, the magic day because, or the magic year, uh, because a, a group of researchers at Corning uh, actually managed to make low loss optical fiber. And they beat uh, Cow's 20 dB number by quite a margin because they produced a 17 dB per kilometer fiber. Uh, now, 3 dBs doesn't sound a lot, but it's actually half the attenuation uh, because it's a logarithmic scale. Uh, so Donald Keck, Robert Maurer, Peter Schultz uh, are, are highly renowned for, uh, for their uh, contribution in, in this respect. Now, notice the wavelength of light, 630 nanometers. Now, that's actually in the visible spectrum. It's, a, um, it, it's just as red is starting to uh, change into orange. And um, the, the problem with uh, certain wavelengths of light is that they don't always uh, pass through glass in a, in a particularly ef uh, efficient way. But you can demonstrate, again, using a, a safe laser pointer, um, how this uh, technique actually works. Um, it, if you don't fancy the, uh, the Tyndall experiment, this is my five-year service award from Infinera. Uh, so I've got my green laser pointer there. Green, by the way, is the most visible color to the human eye. That's why uh, I tend to use it. Uh, and you can see the the impurities in the in the perspex block mean that we can see the beam of light passing through the block. And as I turn the laser pointer, you can see it bouncing off the uh, top side of the uh, of the perspex block. And this is how you create fiber as a waveguide. It it traps the light uh, inside the block. In fact, the way it really works. Uh, is that you have a gradient of of, uh, of refractive index, uh, and it sort of guides the light within the core of the fiber. So why is low loss so important? Um, now, apologies, I did use these slides at, at the at the last uh, meeting, but I, I I do think it's an important point to make because if you've got a kilometer of optical fiber with the kind of loss that we were talking about as a goal for telecommunications, the 20 dB loss, and you manage to make the best optical detector in the world, in other words, that it can reliably detect one single photon in the receiver, then how many photons do you need to put into uh, this fiber? Well, a distance of, of one kilometer, you'd need 100 photons 
uh, in at the transmitter. But at two kilometers, you already need 10,000 photons. And at 10 kilometers, you need 10 to the power 20 photons. That's a lot of photons. Uh, because the fiber is absorbing so many of these photons as, as they pass along it. So, you know, if you assume that there are 3.28 times 10 to the power 80 particles in the observable universe, and you've got your single photon detector with a 20 dB per kilometer loss fiber, how far can you can you go? Well, it's of course it's 42 kilometers. You know, it's it's a it's like the answer to life, the universe, and everything. That's with 20 dB per kilometer loss fiber. But the, the race then started to try to drive down that uh, attenuation. And there are a couple of ways that you can do this. One of the ways is move the wavelength of light. Now, in order to do that, the laser guys have to start working harder because they have to produce lasers that could work at longer wavelengths of light. 850 nanometers uh, is is actually just in the infrared. If you were to make a, an 850 nanometer transmitter, you wouldn't be able to see the light that came from it, but you would see a red glow at the uh, at the transmitter itself as an artifact of the way the light is produced. Uh, the other way the, that uh, this was done is in the optical fiber, uh, the way it works, you have a core of higher refractive index glass. Now, you can do this a couple of different ways. You can put a little sprinkle of titanium oxide, uh, which is the same material that makes paint opaque, by the way. Uh, you have a little sprinkle of that in there, and it raises the refractive index of the core. Uh, but they, they realized that instead of using titanium oxide, if you use germanium oxide, you, you can end up uh, lowering the attenuation of the optical fiber. And at this wavelength of light, back in 1973, they were getting close to the theoretical minimum attenuation. So, of course, the way you do this is push even further into the infrared. So, uh, uh, by 1976, longer wavelength lasers were produced, 1,200 nanometers. And then finally, we get to the wavelengths that we use today, 1,550 nanometers. That was possible by the end of the 70s. Um, and uh, the, 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 the attenuation of the fiber at, at that time was about 0.2 dB per kilometer, and the theoretical minimum is 0.15. Um, and in fact, we're getting quite close to that now because commercial SMF28 ultra-low loss is already at 0.17 dB per kilometer. So now with this wonderful low loss fiber, how many photons would we need for 42 kilometers? Uh, well, again, assuming a, a single photon detector, with the 1970 fiber, of course, we would need more photons than, than in the uh, observable universe. But with this low loss fiber, we only need five photons. That's the difference. That's the, the, the achievement of creating very, very low attenuation optical fiber. Now, the typical amplifier spacing that we use in terrestrial network is about 100 kilometers. We'd only need to put 50 photons in at the transmitter to get one photon out of uh, uh, at, at each of the amplifier hops. But in fact, we put a lot more photons than that into the fiber. Uh, a typical modulation symbol uh, probably contains about, let's just count that, one, two, three, four, five, six, 10 to the 19 um, uh, uh, photons in a in a typical modulation symbol. Now today, we have over a, a billion kilometers of optical fiber deployed. I really need to update that number because I think it's way more than that. I've I've seen uh, numbers as high as four or five uh, billion kilometers, and uh, a billion kilometers you could wrap around the Earth twenty five thousand times. And you know, fiber is becoming ubiquitous. Uh, uh, everywhere, uh, right out uh, into the local loop, even into the uh, the house that I'm talking to to you from at the moment, which is in the middle of nowhere in the UK, uh, but I still am I'm able to get fiber uh, in into the home. Okay, let's change the uh, the tack now to this complementary technology, uh, and I'll be looking at the history of semiconductor lasers. So. Uh, again, it's a it's an interesting topic. It's based on an entirely different set of mechanisms and different chemistries, different elements. Um, but it dates back really to around about 1917 with Albert Einstein describing the concept of stimulated emission. Now, stimulated emission is where you 
you have a, um, uh, uh, some material where the electrons have been stimulated. You, um, uh, or, or they've actually been excited. They've been, they've been given some energy. They're all in excited states now. And of course, excited states will eventually decay randomly. That's spontaneous emission. But if you want to uh, use that light in a useful way, you have stimulated emission. You can stimulate it by sending a photon of exactly the right wavelength past all of these excited photon, uh, uh, electrons, and they drop down at the same time, and they produce light of the same wavelength as the uh, as the photon that stimulated that, that little uh, cascade. So Einstein described this concept, uh, and in 1937, Rudolf Leidenberg experimentally confirmed uh, stimulated emission. Leidenberg's a very interesting guy. He escaped from uh, Germany, um, you know, in about 1932. That was just uh, before Hitler uh, came to power in in, in Germany, uh, and he was responsible. He he brought a lot of um, German physicists over in the 1930s. Not the not the Operation Paperclip stuff after the war, but. Um, physicists that needed to escape from Germany, uh, Leidenberg was responsible for finding them um, positions in the United States uh, uh, so that they could they could continue to work. Uh, in 1939, Valentin Fabricant uh, in the Soviet Union he predicted the use of stimulated emission to amplify short waves. Now, short waves at that point, um, he was actually describing microwaves typically. Um, uh, which are a much longer wavelength than light. Um, but in, in 1947, uh, Willis E. Lamb and R.C. Rutherford, they demonstrated uh, stimulated emission in hydrogen spectra. So this was a, a, a gas medium uh, for stimulated emission, and they won the, uh, the 1955 Nobel Prize for Physics. Alfred Kastler proposed the idea of optical pumping uh, now, he proposed the idea in 1950. He actually shared the 1966 Nobel Prize for Physics. Uh, and optical pumping is the idea. You have to get these electrons into an excited state. So one way is you shine some light into the material uh, and, and, and pump them up to uh, uh, these excited states. So we, we see all of these various ideas floating around. And by 1951, uh, a guy called Joseph Weber proposed the maser. The mic microwave amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. And this is just after the war. Radar uh, during the Second World War took many strides forward. Uh, and, and actually, um, he was using radar uh, type uh, equipment. Uh, that's why he was focused on uh, microwaves at the time. Uh, Weber's an interesting guy, by the way, because he also predicted gravitational waves. Uh, and those of you who follow, sort of popular physics might be aware that we've only very recently been able to measure gravitational waves. Then uh, a group of, of physicists, uh, uh, Prokhorov from uh, the Soviet Union, and then Towns and, and, uh, and Basov. Uh, Towns is from the United States. I'm trying to remember whether Basov is uh, Russian. I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway, they shared the 1964 Nobel Prize for Physics uh, and and this was a this was starting to bring all of this maser uh, technology together. Uh, and what was really interesting, some of the greatest physicists around at the time actually thought that the maser uh, would be impossible. They said, "Oh, it breaks the Heisenberg uncertainty principle." And these are guys like Niels Bohr, who uh, is like he's a giant in uh, uh, in quantum physics. John von Neumann, many of you may be aware of von Neumann from, from early computing uh, theory. And, and they said, oh, no, it's not possible. But, you know, they were proved wrong. So uh, what happened in 1957, uh, a, a group from Bell Labs and uh, uh, Professor Gould from uh, Columbia University, they produced an optical maser. Now, uh, the Bell Labs guys wanted to keep on calling it an optical maser, but Gould uh, actually said, no, we should call it a laser because it's light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. Now, this was theorized uh, at, at the time, but then uh, in 1960, Theodore Maiman actually demonstrated it. He demonstrated it in the lab using a 
pulsed ruby laser. So his gain medium was was a, a chunk of synthetic ruby crystal, and he used an old uh, photographic flash bulb as the optical pump. Uh, now, obviously, that is literally pulsed because every time you want to create a pulse of light, you have to put in a new flash bulb. Not very practical. So um, maybe by using different materials, we could we could get something a little bit more practical. Well, Basoff and Javan in 1960, they proposed the semiconductor laser. So the, the gain material now is a solid state semiconductor. And then uh, in 1962, Robert Hall showed the pulsed semiconductor laser. Now, again, it's a pulsed uh, uh, device, not very practical, not only because it was quite large, uh, but also it had to be cooled with liquid nitrogen to, to, uh, to actually laze. So 1970 kind of brings all of these different ideas together and then converts it into a practical uh, device because uh, uh, Jaurès Alfarov, uh, who, who shared the 1964 Nobel Prize for Physics, and then Hayashi and, and Parrish, uh, I think they were, well, they were certainly in the US, may have been at Bell Labs. Um, they brought together a device that worked at room temperature. It operated in continuous mode. It was based on a semiconductor, which means it's very small. And, and they, they finally sort of bring together this practical laser. That's why the 1970 date uh, is, is seen as so pivotal. So I was actually 10 years old in 1970, which meant uh, the year before I'd watched uh, Apollo 11 land on the moon, uh, and I still had to wait another 10 years for my first computer, which was a Sinclair ZX uh, Spectrum. So the parallel developments of the laser and, and fiber then really started to kick off because we start with this with with this sort of breakthrough where uh, a low enough loss optical fiber is achieved and a practical room temperature continuous operation semiconductor laser is achieved. So how do we make that scale? Um, so we have a few different options with uh, with optical fiber. Uh, one of the options is to simply put a single uh, beam of light along the fiber. And if you want to increase the amount of data that you're transmitting, then instead of operating at 2.5 gigabits per second, you, you might increase the wavelength data rate to, let's say, 10 gigabits per second. Now, in order to do that, you've got to change the electronics. You've got to uh, have more advanced circuitry in order to do it. Uh, and by the way, you may also, once you start transmitting at that higher data rate, you may also start to encounter um, bad things in the optical fiber that you have to deal with, for example, chromatic dispersion. Um, so an alternative is, oh, maybe you could make things scale by putting multiple colors on the same fiber. Um, and of course, then you, you, you're getting, uh, you don't have to depend on higher data rate electronics uh, to keep uh, boosting capacity. You can just go parallel. But you can do both. It depends on where you are in the technology cycle. Uh, sometimes you get an electronics breakthrough that allows you to transmit at higher data rates, or sometimes you may get an optical breakthrough where you have more precision uh, in the optics in order to put more wavelengths onto the fiber. Now, there are various things, of course, that, that we need to appreciate about optical fiber. I've mentioned attenuation already, the, the, the drive towards low attenuation optical fiber. <clears throat> so let's take a look at the at, at this uh, challenge of wavelengths, because the very early lasers were produced at uh, visible wavelengths, and then uh, laser research had to be done, laser breakthroughs had to be made to allow us to transmit at longer and longer wavelengths. And this is why it's important. On the vertical axis here, I I'm showing attenuation in dB, uh, dBs per kilometer. On the horizontal axis is the wavelength. Now that's shown in microns. You multiply by a thousand for, for nanometers, but you can see um, there's, that at shorter wavelengths, there's a, a high attenuation. And the, the phenomenon that causes that is Rayleigh scattering. So Rayleigh scattering is, is literally where photons will bounce off something. And the something is usually... Um, uh, uh, something in the material itself. Uh, it's the it's the molecules or the or the atoms uh, 
uh, within the material itself. At longer wavelengths, the attenuation is dominated by infrared absorption. This is where the, um, the photons are interacting with the molecules and they make them vibrate. Uh, and uh, as they make them vibrate, the energy of the photon is absorbed. Um, and, and at those longer wavelengths, you can see the attenuation start to rise again. The problem is that the, both of these are sort of intrinsic to the material that we're using. In other words, glass, you know, silica, which is the, uh, the material we use to create optical fiber. Uh, now, lasers had to evolve. Back in the mid-70s, we were using gallium arsenide as the uh, semiconductor um, with wavelengths of around about uh, 0.8 uh, microns or 800 nanometers. And that was over multimode fiber as well. Um, by the 1980s, we were using more complex semiconductor uh, material, so a, a sort of mixture of indium, gallium, arsenic, and phosphorus. Now, indium and, and gallium uh, uh, are in what I used to call Group Three. Um, I can't, uh, the, the, they call it a different name now. Um, but but then you have arsenic and phosphorus in what used to be called Group Five. So this is why they're sometimes referred to as three five semiconductors. Uh, and this is a kind of mixture of of these uh, uh, of these elements in order to tune. The, the laser performance so that it operates at longer wavelengths. In this case, 1.3 microns or, or 1,300 nanometers. A lot of early uh, single-mode fiber uh, deployments in the 1980s were actually done at 1,300 nanometers because that was the wavelength you could build lasers to operate at. Now, of course, it's not the ideal wavelength in the fiber because it still has quite high attenuation at 1300 nanometers. So by the 1990s, uh, another sort of flavor of uh, in gas P was, was used uh, that allowed us to transmit at 1550 nanometers or 1.55 microns. Uh, and at that point, you can see we're at the minimum attenuation of the optical fiber. Some of you may have heard of the C band and the L band. That's, that's where, what we're talking about here. The C and the L band, uh, from around about 1530 nanometers to 1565, that's the C-band, 1565 to about 1625 is the uh, L-band. And the lasers that, that they were using at this point are, are more advanced as well. They're single-mode lasers with external modulators in order to achieve higher data rates uh, for transmission. I have to mention... Uh, a major breakthrough, uh, and it was it was done almost at the same time, really, by Sir David Payne in in the United Kingdom, Emmanuel de Severe at Bell Labs, and this was the erbium doped fiber amplifier. So that was around about 1986 when the EDFA was uh, discovered. And what what does it do? Well, you could you could basically say that it triggered the dense wavelength division multiplexing market, the ability to transmit with uh, many wavelengths on the same fiber. Because even with very low loss optical fiber, the attenuation means we need to amplify the signal. And we need a cost-effective way to amplify all of the wavelengths that we're transmitting, ideally in the same piece of equipment. So if we couldn't do that, imagine the situation. This would be an amplifier site where you have to break apart all the wavelengths. You send each wavelength to its own amplifier, and then you put them back together again. Now, that might work fine for two, three, four wavelengths, but when you scale it to like 80 wavelengths, then really you need a single stage device. And that's what the EDFA um, uh, really produced. So the EDFA is a, a, it's a length of fiber that you dope with the element erbium, you optically pump it, and then the data wavelengths that pass through are given additional power uh, by that uh, length of doped fiber. So um, let's take a look at some fiber impairments. Uh, and one of the main impairments that we experience is something called dispersion. Now, dispersion is the phenomenon whereby a modulation pulse ends up being spread out. And there's a reason why it's spread out. Something is causing it to spread out. Now, there are various uh, reasons why it might spread out. One reason might be um, modal dispersion. And modal dispersion uh, is uh, occurs in multi-mode fiber. 
um, multi-mode fiber is uh, sometimes still used today, and it used to be used everywhere. But multi-mode fiber is where the fiber core diameter is more than about 10 times the wavelength that you're transmitting. And the reason that we used to use multi-mode fiber is that was the fiber that we could produce, right? Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a very precise uh, engineering process, and the first kind of fiber that, that was workable happened to be a, have a, a fairly large core diameter. But when you have a large core diameter, what happens is that this nice, clean modulation pulse on the left-hand side there, by the time it gets through the fiber, parts of that modulation pulse may have taken different paths. So the parts of the pulse that travel right down the center of the fiber, they get there quicker. But the parts that bounce off the uh, you know, the insides of the waveguide, they take a bit longer. And so the pulse is, is actually spread out. That's called modal dispersion. How do you solve modal dispersion? You use single mode fiber. And single mode fiber is where the fiber core diameter is very narrow. It's less than 10 times the wavelength of the light that we're transmitting. Now, you, you can see that if you wanted to, if you used different wavelengths in today's single mode fiber, if you used very, very short wavelengths, it would not behave as single mode fiber because the wavelengths uh, uh, might be shorter than than this sort of 10% of the, of the fiber core diameter. So with single mode fiber, there's really only room for one pathway through the fiber, a single mode. Uh, and at the end result is there's almost no modal dispersion. So that's why you know, we don't tend to talk about modal dispersion much these days because we, we always use single mode fiber. Now, um, another kind of dispersion is chromatic dispersion. Now, chromatic, um, I think it comes from the Greek meaning color. Uh, and um, uh, again, the dispersion in this case is caused because a modulation symbol is actually made up of a, of a spread of different colors. Now, in reality, all of these colors, they're in the infrared. We can't see them. Um, but, you know, for the purposes of, of uh, discussion, uh, I'll, I'll use like a little rainbow of colors here. And there's a key point. Um, when different colors of light travel through glass, the lower frequencies or the longer wavelengths travel faster. So the red end of the visible spectrum would travel faster through glass than the blue end. And the end result is that the the red uh, portions of the uh, of the modulation pulse get there before the blue portions, and the pulse is spread out because of color. And it, you know, given that the symbol is actually infrared, we can't see it. It's because of the, they're at different frequencies. Now, when we look at optical fiber, um, people realized that chromatic dispersion would be a problem. So good old G652, which is, you know, it's the most widely deployed fiber um, in, in long-haul networks in the world, its zero dispersion point was actually engineered to be uh, at 1310 nanometers. Because remember, 1310 nanometers, those were the lasers that we could actually manufacture when G652 was first designed. And this is the total dispersion profile in blue. Um, the red line is actually the material dispersion. This is the dispersion, the chromatic dispersion of, of the glass itself. But optical fiber is a waveguide, and there is a waveguide dispersion component. You can engineer the waveguide dispersion um, component. You can't really engineer the material dispersion unless you change the kind of material that you're using. Um, but you can engineer the waveguide dispersion, and that's how you could set the zero dispersion wavelength of the fiber. Now, another kind of uh, dispersion is uh, caused by uh, the fact that light is uh, has different um, axes of, of oscillation. So we think about this as uh, an X and a Y axis. The Z axis is actually the direction of propagation of the light. That's the direction that light is traveling in. But as it travels, um, the light has energy that's oscillating in, in an X and a Y uh, axis. Now, optical fiber 
has tiny radial variations. So you could imagine at an instant in time that one of these polarizations might move more quickly than the other. So in this case, I'm just going to show that the Y uh, uh, axis is moving faster than the X axis. Now, in real fiber, unfortunately, that can vary as you go along the fiber. So sometimes the Y axis will be the fast mode, but a little bit further along the fiber, it might be the X, ac uh, X uh, axis that is the fast mode. But for simplicity, you can, you can see that, that what's happening here is that the different parts of the modulation pulse might be spread out. And that's PMD or polarization mode dispersion. Now, we can compensate for some of these technologies and we can do it in various ways. Uh, one of the ways we can do, do this is uh, with chromatic dispersion, when the industry moved from 2.5 gigabits per second to 10 gigabits per second per wavelength, that was around in, in, the, in the late 90s, um, we found that we needed to put some dispersion compensating fiber into the network and you can see the roles the spools of dcf are actually located in in the amplifier sites and in the uh, terminal now when pmd uh, became a problem um we this was a a little bit of an issue because it was when we tried to increase from 10 gigabits per second per wavelength to 40 gigabits per second per wavelength. And that was around about 2002-ish, uh, the first time that we tried it. And when that uh, was attempted, we found that polarization mode dispersion suddenly became a problem at these very high transmission rates. And uh, the industry uh, got their, their heads together and they created PMD compensators. And the problem with those compensators is that you had to uh, have one per wavelength you had to have one uh, for each transponder. They were usually bigger than the transponder, and they cost more than the transponder. So that was why 40 gigabit per second transmission didn't really take off in the early 2000s, because it required these PMD compensators. Imagine if that was like 80 wavelengths, which was very common in the early 2000s. Uh, that would have been hideously expensive. Now, there's also a set of uh, effects that are based on nonlinear behavior. Now, what's the difference between linear and nonlinear? A linear effect is something like attenuation, because attenuation, if you go twice as far along the fiber, your attenuation is twice as bad. Well, that's a linear uh, relationship. But there are nonlinear effects that literally do not happen at lower power levels, lower optical power levels in the fiber. They only kick in if you try to transmit at higher optical power levels. And that's because glass is a nonlinear medium. Air is not, by the way. Wireless transmission, you don't have to worry about that. So those of you involved in Wi-Fi, you can, you know, when you move to higher Wi-Fi data rates, you can just go to higher modulation order, like 1,024 qualm or 2,048 qualm. And the way that you deal with the reduction in signal-to-noise ratio is you turn up the power at the transmitter. Well, you can't do that in optical uh, transmission, uh, not forever anyway. You can turn it up to a certain point, but then beyond that point, you're going to hit the nonlinear effects. And these were discovered a long time ago. Back in 1875, Scottish phys physicist called John Kerr, uh, he... Uh, um, discovered the Kerr effect. Now, the Kerr effect, if you look at the blue uh, line um, uh, above here, you can see that that's an, that's a, uh, that would be called a, um, an RZ uh, optical pulse. It's a return to zero optical pulse. But the, the front of the pulse, the optical power increases uh, very, very quickly, uh, and it causes a change in the refractive index of the optical fiber if the optical power level is high enough. And it's that change in, in uh, refractive index that is the problem. Uh, because the end result is that you have unfortunate effects like self-phase modulation, which is where an individual wavelength of light, if you're modulating uh, a too high a power level, the modulation symbols actually start to interfere with themselves. They, they start to, you know, there's, there's like an internal crosstalk. Cross-phase modulation is where neighboring wavelengths 
interfere with each other because they're spaced too closely together. And then there's this weird effect called four, four wave mixing, which is where um, two wavelengths of sufficiently high power level will actually create two phantom wavelengths. Uh, and, and those phantom wavelengths are equally spaced wave uh, frequencies. So they, they very often will overlap neighboring wavelengths um, or neighboring frequencies uh, in the fiber. So all of these effects are very bad. Now, the traditional approach to nonlinear mitigation, first of all, you control your optical launch power levels and also the optical power levels in the amplifiers. You can't um, turn up those power levels too high. You could also use optical fiber that has a high chromatic dispersion, like good old G652 fiber. And a high chromatic dispersion, the irony is it it spreads out the uh, the modulation pulses, so the power changes, the optical power changes, are not too extreme. And you can also use optical fiber that has a large effective area, because now you're spreading the power of the modulation pulse over a larger area of the glass. So all of these things are true, by the way, in G652 fiber. Well, uh, low optical launch power, that's that's decided by the, uh, by the network operator, but High chromatic dispersion, large effective area are properties of G652. But we have new nonlinear mitigation techniques um, that, that are a, a development of the coherent transponder timeline. Nyquist subcarriers, uh, soft decision forward error correction, gain sharing, super Gaussian PCS, nonlinear compensation. Now, these are all sort of technical details of how a given implementation would work, but they all come about as a result of the fact that we can now use very powerful digital signal processing in our transponders. And you can also imagine there's a sort of uh, there's a drive to pr to try to find the best optical fiber. And um, what we saw in the in the early eighties, uh, the only wavelengths that we could build were thirteen ten nanometer lasers not ideal for the attenuation that's in the optical fiber, but that's where we put the zero chromatic dispersion wavelength for G652. So uh, G652, it's, a, you know, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's an 80 square micron effective area fiber um, with uh, zero chromatic dispersion at 13, 10 nanometers. But unfortunately, by the time we get to the mid eighties where we can build 15, 50 nanometer lasers, they may be at the lowest attenuation of the optical fiber. But if you're using G652, you're now operating in a very high chromatic dispersion area. Now, this is the, the mid 80s. We don't have coherent technology available because with coherent, you could actually just correct for chromatic dispersion. But this is when we need lots of dispersion compensating fiber in the network. Now, if you put a lot of DCF in the network, you're actually reducing your optical transmission budget, and you're also adding a lot of latency because you need lots of this fiber uh, that's really going nowhere. It's just sitting as spools in the network. So somebody said, well, why don't we build a different kind of fiber? We can engineer the chromatic dispersion so that uh, the zero dispersion point is at 1550 nanometers. And that's G653, dispersion shifted fiber. Now, I can't find a, um, an effective area on G653. <laughs> G653 is the fiber that, you know, it's like the Halloween fiber. It's horror fiber. Um, it, it, it's not the kind of fiber you want in your network. Um, I'll tell you why in a moment. But uh, literally because of when the deployments were made, you can find a lot of G653 in Italy, in South America, in Japan, in some parts of the United States. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a minority because fortunately, I don't think we deployed all that much of it before we kind of realized that there's a bit of a problem because both of these fiber types were originally designed for single wavelength transmission. So when DWDM came along in the mid 90s, you've got uh, G653 with very low dispersion, and in order to operate with a high optical power level, like for example, if you're using uh, ED for amplifiers, you end up with a high nonlinear penalty, and that that's why G653 it means you can't really get all that much capacity in that fiber with DWDM. So the answer is let's change the fiber again. <laughs> 
they came up with G655, non-zero dispersion shifted fiber. And this is a little bit like Goldilocks, if you think about it, because at 1550 nanometers, G652 has too much chromatic dispersion. But G653 really doesn't have en enough. But G655 was supposed to have just enough to allow you to have a lower nonlinear penalty because of the chromatic dispersion, um, but not so much chromatic dispersion that you need loads of DCF in your network. But then people said, yeah, but in order to um, engineer the, the, the waveguide so that we have that dispersion, we've now got a very small effective area, 52 square microns, which also has a, an effect on the nonlinear penalty. So they, they kind of went back to the drawing board and came up with something called G655, large effective area fiber or leaf. Uh, this is a variant of G655. What that means, it still has a, uh, a fairly low uh, dispersion in the C-band, um, but it now has a, a larger effective area than G, uh, the original G655. It's 72 square microns. Still not as much as the original G652, by the way, but um, but it is a, a, a better uh, fiber for single wavelength, 10 gigabit transmission. So is this just right? Is this a perfect fiber? Uh, and really the answer is no, <laughs> because what happened uh, from 2010 onwards is we start to have coherent technology coming along. And we now have five generations of coherent technology. Uh, these are the dates of their commercial introduction. Uh, and these are some of the characteristics of each generation. So we see as we progress uh, through the generations, the uh, modulation constellations become more complex from QPSK right through to 64 QAM. And then we have um, uh, probabilistically shaped uh, 64 QAM in the latest generation. Uh, we have increasing board rates. These are the, uh, the board rate is the rate at which you send modulation symbols. And on along the bottom, you see the the drivers behind that. It's the fact that we can have more and more advanced ASICs uh, for the optical engines in these coherent transmitters. And the end result, a higher data rate per wavelength and a, a greater capacity in the C-band uh, for each of these generations. And um, the other thing that we can do, of course, with coherent is that we can completely compensate for chromatic dispersion. So the irony is the best fiber for, uh, well, the, the best sort of widely used fiber for uh, coherent transmission these days is good old G652. And if you happen to have uh, SMF28 ultra low loss, uh, that's even better because it's a, it's a very low loss version of G652. Um, and it, it's funny the way that that sort of fiber technology has now come full circle because that was the original kind of fiber deployed. And this is really all because uh, semiconductor lasers are a superb source of light that scales to mass production. And of course, optical fiber is an amazingly inexpensive and efficient waveguide. Think about it. We're basically making this stuff from sand. So um, it, although you can get sort of... Uh, uh, supply chain shortages, which I, I, I think some people are experiencing uh, experiencing at the moment with optical fiber, um, the base material is essentially uh, very inexpensive. So the reason that I'm so passionate about this particular topic is I originally qualified as a plastics chemist. I moved into telecommunications, but you know it's funny, I, I still almost like a hobby, I, I st I'm still interested in chemistry. And I see these two technologies with completely unrelated chemistries and also the origins of them, the, the, the physical processes by which they work are different. And yet they come together and work uh, so well. And you know, the claim that has optical networking really transformed our world, I, I think it has because there is no there is no alternative. You know, when we think about um uh, the, the scale of the internet, the distances involved and the growing demand, you all need this thing to keep going strong. And, you know, could you do that without the kind of capacity that optical networks uh, give to you? 
There really is no alternative. I don't think there's an alternative in sight. We can keep on pushing the boundaries. Um, and and we, you know, in my previous talk, actually, I I talked about some of the alternative fiber types that we might use. But you know, in essence, the the baseline is still uh, optical fiber and semiconductor lasers. I hope that's been useful. I hope you've been able to hear me okay, and uh, happy to answer any questions if we have time. We do not appear to have any questions, but thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much. Thank you.